Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fonko Zay's Voices of Hope webcast, episode two. I'm Sana Lathan, and I'd like to personally thank you for coming today. The empowering work Fonko Zay is doing with poor and disenfranchised communities across Haiti is so impactful and I am so thrilled to support their efforts. For over two decades, Fonko Zay has walked in solidarity with the poor through natural disasters and socio-political unrest and they will continue to do so until there's no such thing as extreme poverty. I hope that once you've watched this Voices of Hope episode, you will be moved to take action. Thank you for being a voice of hope for those who need it the most. Everybody, and welcome to Flanc Jose's second um, uh, installment of Voices of Hope. I'm so excited to welcome you today. It looks like online right now we have 59 attendees. Um, and with me on video, you are going to um, meet um, my colleague, uh, Corinne Rowanen, who is the Executive Director of Franco Zay um, Foundation. Um, I also have on here Stanley Francois, who is a CLM case manager. Um, so excited to have him here and have had the opportunity to meet with him. 2020 has been um, so difficult and we haven't been able to travel to Haiti like we usually do. And so to have a chance to, to talk on video is really great. Thank you, Stanley, for being here being here and thank you, Corinne. Um Hebert Artus, who is the director of the CLM program, is supposed to be joining us. However, he is in a place where his signal is not great. And so um I'm gonna ask um Stephen, who uh, manages the um, helps to manage the CLM program, to join us. Um, he's been on standby. Stephen, will you? Uh, yay! There you are. So good to have you all on here. Okay, so a little bit of how this is going to go. Um, first of all, a little bit of logistics to everybody. We're going to do a little bit of an interview. Um, with my colleagues, and then there's going to be an opportunity for a Q&A. In your webinar, you should be able to see a Q&A spot. Please um, put your questions there. Uh, we have people waiting in the wings to be able to read those questions and share, with, share them with the panelists. So without further ado, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And um, Stephen, if I may, I'm going to start with you. If everyone will unmute, please, so we can hear everyone. Um, Stephen, I'm going to start with you. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how long you've been with Franco Day? Um, and just tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, thanks, Mabel. I uh, have been working full time for Franco Day since 2009 though I really started working with the foundation in 2005. Those, those first years, I was mainly a volunteer helping out with the education programs. But uh, uh, I started on staff in 2009 and I joined the CLM program in 2010. So I've been with CLM for a little more than 10 years. I'm uh, um, a teacher from the States. Uh, 
I used to teach at a small college and uh, I started coming to Haiti to be involved in education and one thing led to another. And uh, now I'm very lucky to be working for CLM. All right, thank you very much. Um, Stanley, can you share a little bit about yourself and how long you've been working at Funko Bay? Well, um, my name is Stanley and I'm from Guamba and Haiti. And I'm working for Funko Bay as a case manager since um, March, 2017. Amazing, thank you. And Corinne? A um, little bit about you and how you came to be part of Franco Z. Okay, so my name is Karen Ronan. I'm originally from Belgium, but I've been living and working in Haiti since 1995. Um, my background, originally I'm a medical doctor, but I haven't been practicing medicine for a long time. I've slipped away from practicing man medicine to managing health programs to managing programs and managing organizations. So I've been involved with Font Jose since 2005. I was first a member of their board, the board of the foundation from 2005 to 2008. At that time, I was the country director for Concern Worldwide, an Irish NGO. And then I joined Foncose in 2009, right before the earthquake. And that's when I became the executive director of the foundation. And I've had the, the privilege of, of working with this great team all since then. Amazing. Thank you all three of you for everything that you do on the ground. Um, Foncose would not be Foncose and our clients would not be able to get the services that they do without you. So our hats off to you and our deepest thanks. Um, Stephen, I think that I would start with you. Can you tell me, um, because I think that we probably have people online who don't know CLM as we refer to it by the acronym, um, mm -hmm. can you give me a bit about a background on the program? What does CLM stand for? Um, kind of what was the, the genesis of it? And uh, yeah. So CLM uh, stands for Chemin La Vie Mieux. In um, Haitian Creole, that means the path to a better life. And it was a program that Foncose adopted as a response to the discovery that the, um, that the credit programs that are the real core of Foncose's work were not able to reach the poorest Haitians. They just weren't, uh, there are families too poor to make use of credit. Um, and so uh, Foncose looked around the world at different kinds of programs uh, designed for especially for poor people. And we were lucky to find one in Bangladesh that seemed right for us. So um, we worked together with an institution called BRAC in Bangladesh to um, learn their targeting the ultra poor program. And we worked with one another and with them to adapt it to the special characteristics of Haiti. And we, we tested it in 2007, 2008. And when the pilot went really well, we started uh, scaling up and we've been doing it at scale since 2010. That's, that's, that's impressive. I, I feel like their the adoption of a program that worked someplace else so effectively to Haiti was critical, I think, in some of the success that this this program has been able to achieve because it's not just a one size fits all approach, right? It has to be adapted to the local context, and so Franco Jose has been amazing at that, and also now been able to replicate that in, in, in beyond the original location, which was Mirabole, is that right? Yeah, originally it was, uh, we tested it in three different locations. One was in the far west end of Laguanave. One was in Trudenor in the northeast. And the other one is just outside of uh, Mirabole in a commune called Bukankare. Okay, okay. Thank you, Stephen, for that. Um, overview. Stanley, 
I, I think a lot of people are going to be excited to hear from you in particular because you give color to what it is a case manager does every day. So can you tell me a little bit about your responsibilities as a case manager? For example, what does your week look like? How many members do you visit? How many miles does it take to get to a member? Do you use a motorbike all the time? Do sometimes you have to walk? If you have to stay, where do you sleep? Um, it just we want to hear your story. Wait, you have to unmute yourself. Well, about my responsibilities as a case manager, um, each week I have to visit 50 members and they live in many different places. So the father's one lives in area of Fage and uh, to arrive there, I have to ride my motorcycle um, across the river to up the mountain for one hour. And then I have to leave the motorcycle and work uh, about two hours to um, arrive with um, the father's one. She's, she's name is Nicole. And about the um, unexpected challenge, um, I can say, as you already know, we work in very far places in the countryside. So sometimes one of the unexpected um, challenge we, um, we face, I can say it, um, it's a, the coming of a very heavy rain. And when this happened, sometimes we have to sleep in somewhere in the area, maybe with um, a leader in the area, and we can't um, we, um, come home. I have to unmute myself. Yeah, so I, every time you tell that, because obviously we practiced before we did this, everybody, it's a little peek behind the curtain. Um, it's such a, it has such an impact on me personally, because if you haven't been to Haiti, or maybe if you have been, um, when Stanley talks about his experience, you feel like you see him going the mountain to visit this family. And just the fact that Juan Jose goes that extra mile is is huge, especially for these, these people that we're serving. So thank you, Stanley, for, for everything that you do for, for our clients every day. Um, Stephen, can you tell me a little bit about, I know um, CLM has been going through some transitions, um, looking at youth, moving into new locations. What's the vision that um, that Franco Day has for CLM over the next five years? Yeah, well, the, um, the fundamental truth that we have to confront is that the problem of uh, ultra poverty is bigger than Franco Jose. So one of the most important threads for us to follow in these next five years are collaborations that are gonna bring larger entities like the Haitian government and like, like the really big international organizations into this problematic. And so, um, and we've made a fair amount of progress there, um, linking up with the Ministry of Social Affairs, um, so it, we're encouraged. At the same time, we see that um, as much as Fon Jose is a woman-focused organization, and as much as we in particular in CLM work very predominantly with women, we have some work to do to really address some gender issues within our program. So Gender, we don't have a disciplined, comprehensive approach to gender-based violence within the program. Um, that's just an example. And so in the next five years, I think you're gonna see us um, moving in a way towards more of a, um, how should I say that, social work model, where we're really trying to address 
the fundamental issues of empowerment beyond just helping people develop their own live, livelihood. So there would be those two things. That's actually really interesting. And really, I think for folks that are listening, um, I think will will be really powerful in, for them because as you were a cutting edge, as we were a cutting edge organization to bring the graduation program to Haiti, we are thinking about things beyond just the regular livelihood like you just said. And we're thinking about other issues that really impact poverty, which I think it's important for people to understand. Um, so thank you. For, that's a that's a great that's a great um, look at what's going to happen going forward. Um, Stanley, a question for you. In America, we've we've been we still are uh, managing COVID nineteen. Do we open school? Do we not open school? Can we go to a restaurant? Can we not go to a restaurant? How has COVID-19 impacted or not um, the CLM participants? Well, um, the coronavirus has a big impact on our work um, because some of our activities um, always done in group. And when um, when the the coronavirus um, is coming, so we had to to find another way to do these activities like um, training, like um, a screen for screening for malnutrition, and like the mobile clinic. So. Um, Sometimes sometime, um, we have um, um, some difficulty to find the, 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 the participant by phone, and then we have to wear a, wear a mask. So, and the participant have um, difficult to adapt, adapt with um, these changes. So I, I can say the coronavirus had has still has a big um, impact on our work. And even so, you continue to manage to be able to serve the clients, which I think is the silver lining in this story. And I know Fon Jose, um, Stephen had done significant work as well, Corinne, in, pre in preparing um, both the staff and providing masks and hand washing opportunities for clients and, and for um, for members. So I know that you all had a big plan and rolled out uh, a lot um, to be able to prepare because you learn from other places, um, which I think is a half of the battle. Um, so Stephen, back to you. Um, Font Jose was one of the first organizations to implement a graduation approach. Um, can you give some examples of how you've been able to share your expertise with other organizations? I know that you talked about the government of Haiti. Um, so can you expand a little bit about on that, please? Yeah, uh, we expand, we've provided our expertise in a couple of different ways. So uh, one of them is that we participate in discussions of um, a network of institutions across the world that uh, ado have adopted versions of the graduation approach. We've also provided close technical assistance to two other organizations in Haiti that have adopted the graduation approach. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that, I don't know if it's true now, but for a long time, we were the only country in the world, only Francophone country in the world to have any expertise at all. And so, when an organization in Burkina Faso wanted to experiment with the graduation approach, um, they sent for Hebert, our program, program director, who spent a, several weeks there providing technical assistance. Yeah, so, so again, Franco Jose being on the cutting edge. And Stephen, I know that we've had more people join since we started at five o'clock. Would you mind giving me and and them um, 
uh, we've been talking about this, you know, program that serves the poorest of the poor, and it's a graduation model. But can you kind of break down what those pieces are um, so that folks who just joined can really get a better sense of that or those that have been listening and maybe have that question? Um, in yeah. complete layman terms, thanks. Yeah, no, um, I'm very happy to try to do that. Uh, the fundamental thing to understand about the graduation pro approach is that it's based on an old, pro an old saying, which is that um, if you... Um, give someone a fish, they'll fish, for, they'll eat for a day. If you teach them to fish, they'll, they'll eat for a lifetime. And what, what we've discovered is that it's not quite true because if you give them, a, a, teach them to fish and they don't have the tools, then you haven't helped them. So the graduation approach is fundamentally about combining training, training someone to use tools, giving someone the tools they'll need and then coaching them through abusing those tools to make sure they succeed. So we provide training in uh, managing certain kinds of businesses. We actually transfer to the members the assets they'll need to start those businesses. We provide 18 months of close coaching from people like Stanley to um, make sure that the businesses succeed. And then finally, we surround them with a series of protections like access to healthcare, like a water filter, like um, a safe and secure home that give them the best possible chance to succeed at changing their own lives. Thank you. And Stephen, Anne Hastings, um, was the one that together with you, right, that started to put together this type of program. I, I, I'm, I. Oh, I, I, I would love to take credit. This is Anne, but she, Anne, she Anne, went together. Anne had the chance to go to Bangladesh. She <laughs> thought she was going to see, visit the Grameen Bank, which was very famous. Mm -hmm. And while she was there, she ended up meeting with folks at BRAC. And um, talked to them, and that was when they uh, she decided that no, this was the way we had to go. And she came back to Haiti through conversations with uh, Karin and Karin's old organization, Concerned Worldwide. Uh, they were able to build uh, a partnership that eventually drew the funding they needed to. Um, Adapt the program and give it a try. Give it, give it a try. Awesome. Thank you for that little bit of history. I think it'll be helpful for the folks that are listening. Um, Stanley, I have a couple more questions for you. Um, let me see. Um, so it's a graduation program. So after a cohort graduates, what kind of impact do they have on their community? Um, and can you give some examples of that? Um, after um, course graduates, graduate, some of them um, become economically and socially uh, one of the most important people in the, in the community. Like I say, I said economically and socially. By example, I I met I met um, Fedlin. She's she's one of um, she's graduate from the first court here, and I met her in the bank account. I I, I met her in um, the SSSFF. Um, service financier from Jose. And then I was like, um, Felin, what are you doing here? And then she said, she probably said, uh, say, I come to save money on my money on my bank account. And I was like, um, let's see. And it was um, um, 50,000 good. So um, now, Fedlin is a wall wall seller. 
in the community. So that's amazing. So she has yeah. for for cu currency conversion purposes 50,000 gourds. Um Stephen and Corinne, maybe you can help me if it's about 68 to 1. Say 62 62 so, so um what 50,000 goods is um $800 something like that so she saved $800 Stanley that's that's pretty impressive that's pretty impressive um i have one other question for you Stephen actually it's a two part question um and i think Part of it is related to Stanley's question about um, the, the woman who graduated and has now a savings account. SFF does financial inclusion. Franco Zay engages in financial inclusion. So what kind of, what strategies are we also promote, promoting among the CLM program for that? And then if you could give some, just a little bit of data about the CLM staff, how many are um, women, how you know how many how many staff uh, are are women? How many um, women we serve um, in the CLM program? Which I think it's all of them, right? Pro almost, almost, almost. Yeah, um, just so that our our folks that are listening can get um, a sense of that. So, sorry if that was a bit of a complicated question. No, it, it, it's it's not really. We have, if my, if I, I just did the count in my head, and I think right now we have something like 42 case managers. It's, it should be slightly more than 40, or, or right around 40, and um, maybe a quarter of them, or a little more than a quarter of them, are women. So um, that's not great, but it's much better than it has been in the past. You know. It, we, but we've made we're making a very um, conscious effort to move forward with that. The um, we have a couple thousand, roughly a couple thousand families that we're working with right now, and probably ninety six ninety seven percent of the members whom we work with are women. So um, generally speaking, to qualify for this program, you have to be either a woman with dependents, dependent children, or an individual with disabilities. And of course, in that second group, you can have some men. We have on very rare occasion come across men who are widowers or for some other reason have a large number of children and we try not to let Karin know, but we, um, we do sometimes take them. Very few, there, there might have been five or six over the course of 10 years. Well, she, she just found out. <laughs> she's, she's very good at not letting us know that she knows what we're doing. She knows. Very, very good. And so CLM promote, promoting um, financial inclusion, is that, how does that? Oh, yeah. So uh, we do a couple different things. One of the things we've discovered is that there's a real issue around the logic that drives our put, footprint and the logic that drives uh, service financier Foncose financial services footprint. The logic driving their footprint is sustainably helping the poor make progress. But that sustainably is really key. They can only work in places that make it possible for them as a whole to be at least break even. So that doesn't mean that they can't do some losing in some places, but not so much that it overbalances the more profitable, place, profitable places. We, on the other hand, are committed to going wherever the, um, the people who need us are. It's easy for us to do that in a way because 
we don't have to generate any revenue, right? So that what that means is, is that there are places where our financial inclusion strategy can include helping people integrate themselves into phone cause financial services. But there are other places where that's not a realistic option. In those places, we have been establishing what are called um, village savings and loan associations, which are small groups of uh, 25, 30 people who um, save together and um, uh, use a pot that they, that they accumulate to give loans within the group as well. Um, and so it, it's a kind of, it's very formal in a way in the sense that there are very strict rules governing its operation, but it's not, in, they're not institutions. So it's a, we call it semi-formal financial in inclusion. Thank you, that's very helpful. And I would assume that there are people that, you know, just choose not to do either, right? Because that it, that's the other be beautiful thing I find about CLM is that once you are empowered to make your own determination in kind of your own way and, and know that you have those tools and resources, you get to choose. You get to choose if you join a VSLA, you get to choose if you go to FFF, or choose not, not neither, and that's okay too. And so I, I find that to be a very valuable piece of this. Um, so Stanley, I have one last question for you before I start with my questions with Corinne. And that is, Stanley, what would you like to tell um, the folks that are listening here today um, about the work, the work of Franco Jose is doing um, in CLM in Haiti? What would you like them to remember the most? What's most important? Wait, you have to, you have to unmute. Yeah, please. Can, can you repeat again? Yeah, so what would you like to tell everyone that's listening about the most important thing about um, Franco Jose's work in the CLM program? What to you seems to be the most important thing that you want them to remember about CLM? Um, I just want to um, tell them um, Foncose and or CLM um, Foncose is one of the the most prestigious um, institution in the country, um, not because I'm working at Funk Jose, but but um, it's uh, true. And I would like to tell them how I hope one day the CLM program um, established in all over in Haiti. And for, for that, we need um, partners, we need the um, money, we need the uh, support um, to do that. And you know what? So we, we, we don't do polity. So I say, um, Foncose don't do polity. But you know something? Um, I think um, even um, the Haitian government um, cannot do in 18 years, what Foncose does um, for this um, participant in 18 months. So um, I hope one day, as like I said, I hope one day the, the, the program, the CLM program um, established all over in Haiti um, because it, it's, uh, it's the best program for me. Um, and we have a good um, go, we have a good mission. So we need support, we need partners and we need money to, um, to um, do our work. Thank you, Stanley. And thank you, Stephen, too, for stepping in last minute for a bear. Um, you guys are inspirational and make me um, motivated to continue to do what we do on this side um, to be able to support you. And so thank you for taking the time this evening 
for talking to us if you want to hang out just a little bit because I know folks are going to have some Q and A. So I'm going to ask Corinne a few questions and then we can jump into a more interactive portion of the program where um, people will have questions for you. So Corinne, thank you for being patient um, and for being here tonight. Um, so you've had some success recently in getting the Haitian government, like Stephen mentioned um, and, and Stanley mentioned, um, to adopt CLM as a formal strategy to address ultra poverty. Um, can you tell me about this success in, in broad terms? Okay. What actually happens is that the, the government um, adopted a national policy on social protection and social promotion. And in that policy, they recognize two very important things. The first thing is that they recognize that not all poor people are at the same level of poverty. And so not all poor people need the same level and kind of support. And the second thing they recognize is that um, the graduation methodology, which is what CLM uses, can be very effective in helping ultra poor families who are able to take back control of their life to actually do so. You know, this, this is important because sometimes Haiti, Haiti is described as a, a fragile or even a failed state. And, and part of that is because the Haitian government struggles a lot to actually deliver the basic services it needs to deliver to, to its population. So the, for the government to actually adopt a policy that says we want to do something for the poorest amongst our citizens and we want to help them in an effective way to actually help them whether shocks or get back on their feet and get back control of their lives is really important. And I think we can say Foucault has been instrumental in making sure that national policy included the ultra poor and included the idea that you could actually help these people take back control of their lives. And we did that through research. We worked with partners, both Haitians and international to document and research our work on CLM, being very transparent about what works and what doesn't work. And we shared those results with the government together with our research partners. And that allowed us to make alliances and to create partnerships that in the end, I think, um, led to graduation being part of that new policy. That's really impressive and amazing. And um, I think we had a question in the Q&A. Um, Eve Louis Jacques, I hope I did not slaughter your name. Um, I hope that Corinne's response helped your answer your question about integration with country level economic development initiatives. I know that for Franco Day and Corinne, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it is, we are apolitical, but it's also important for us to see that our program gets into the fabric of policy because I think that ultimately it is, like Stanley says, to be able to be more broad reaching throughout Haiti to be able to serve as many people as possible. Um, so let me ask you this question because a lot of, I, I get this sometimes too from folks, they ask me like how, what kind of strategies um, does, do you and your team used to measure success at, at, at CLM? And, and what's the thing that's hardest to measure, I guess I would say, I would ask. Okay, so the ultimate goal of CLM, like Steve was saying and like Stanley explained, was to empower families through the women, but it's essentially about families, empower families to improve their living conditions. And we measure the achievement of that goal by the regular, you know, we, we have a bunch of indicators, Stanley knows because he has to collect all of that information. But so we collect information on what's the house of the person like, how much, many assets do they have? Do they save? How much do they save? What is their health like? What is the health of the children like? Etc. Etc. There's a whole range of indicators like that. 
which now people like, like Stanley actually collect that information on tablets more and more, it's not everywhere yet, but the more and more it's being done on tablets. And we collect that information typically at baseline and then at six months, at 12 months, and at the end when they graduate. And we also try when we have, this, when we have the means to go back to women two years, four years after graduation to see that indeed this empowerment, like Steve was saying, is sustainable. It's not just something that they're feeling good during the project, but it really gives them that big push so that after that, they kind of on a pathway to an, an improved living condition that is sustainable. Now, all these numbers, it's a bunch of numbers really, but all these numbers don't really tell the story of, of the transformation that CLM brings in the lives of the women we work with. And to document that, I think what we try and do, it's difficult. You know, we would actually have to film a woman like that during, during 18 months to see how profoundly transformative this program is. But the, but the next best thing is case studies. It's actually telling the story of a person. But also we have like professional researchers doing in-depth case studies for us so that we can really see how these um, how this transformation is happening. Now, the most difficult thing with all this research and this monitoring and evaluation, like we say, is not necessarily what we can and cannot measure. It's that there's a number of difficult ethical questions that are linked to these systems. Because on the one hand, doing it properly is important because we want to be accountable to our donors. We want to be accountable to the Haitian people and to the women themselves. We want to make sure that what we offer is actually really making a difference in the lives of people. And for that, we need to measure what we're doing. Okay, so on the one hand, this is really very important. On the other hand, it is also very expensive. You know, it regularly when we, mostly we try and do it internally, but one survey costs $40. You want in-depth research. You need three pieces of research to three interviews with thousands of people. So it's, it's getting the balance right between investing in monitoring, evaluation and research and making sure that the key of what we do is still empowering the women and not spending tons and tons of money on, on, on measuring how we do it. So it's a bit of a difficult balance to get. It, it's a dance, I, I, I know. And I, I think that um, the international community um, in terms of, oh, and I should back up and say, you recently had a study, or I know, I know that we shared with some of our supporters the study that was done in the UK. Okay, mm -hmm. did I get that right? Yes, on CLM, and it was it was pretty Im powerful and, and, and impactful. I, I, I urge those of you that are listening, if you haven't had an opportunity to read that, you can find that on our website and through all of our social media channels um, as well. It's really, really interesting and, ve and very, very, very eye-opening. Um, and, and you use, obviously, all of this research as well to kind of augment and support the um, the, gra the graduation community of practice. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about, about that? Okay, I think like Steve was explaining, at the beginning, we were like a member of a group of organizations in like there were 10, 10 organizations replicating Brack's model in six or seven countries. Um, and we were part of that initial group. And so it was really powerful because we were learning together. You know, it was being done in Honduras, it was being done in Yemen, it was being done in India and in Bangladesh. So it was, we were all learning together how this model worked, what needed to be adapted and what should remain the way it was. 
that was really powerful because we had the support from the, the Ford Foundation and a, a World Bank House donor group who kind of got us together every year. And there was a lot of exchange and relationships that still stand until now, you know, and that, that was kind of the beginning of that global community of practice around graduation. And like I said, at that time, it was like 10 organizations and six or seven countries. Um, now that project finished in 2015. Since then, that community of practice grew like poof exponentially because the, the graduation model is being used in over close to 60 countries now by a myriad of, of organization, including over 20 governments. You know, so the, the community of practice has gotten much bigger and is now being managed directly by one of the practices of the, of the World Bank. So we're kind of a small cog in that big family, but we're still kind of a bit of a reference. And so very often people come to visit us. Steve and the team have received people from Honduras, from, was it Ecuador, Steve? I don't remember. There were a couple of countries where, you know, some partners, because we were at that time the only graduation program in the, in the, in the region, several people came to visit us so that they could actually translate it into their reality. So um, we remain involved with that community of practice also in exchanging information, including recently a whole um, workshop and research on graduation and gender. How do, how do graduation program contribute to the empowerment of women further than just acquiring more resources, but also about trusting themselves, about access and control of the resources, and about building a voice together so that they become agents of change in their community. Colleagues, you have been amazing um, this evening. I I think you've given us so much information that it it's it's maybe for some been a refresher about what CLM is, and for others it's been a little bit of a wow. It's actually more than just um, people going through a program in 18 months, but it's actually something that is um, seen as a as a model for other people to follow and other other people to learn from and I think that that's really important too um, because Juan Jose might be small but we are mighty um, so one of the questions that we have uh, here first this evening is from Marie who asked about current uprisings in Haiti and a question also from Rosemary about exchange rate fluctuations, um, especially the ones we've seen over the last month. And I know that's been a challenge for all of us as we kind of think about, get our heads around that, and how do we how do we work? So, can you tell us um, about the current context? That can, any one of you is fine, um, and how this is impacting the CLM program specifically and our our members. Um. Maybe shortly, and then Steve and Stanley can jump in if they want to. Um, right now, the, the, the political situation is, is relatively unstable. We, we have a government um, that doesn't necessarily is very, very uh, widely loved, uh, nor liked, nor has a lot of legitimacy and they govern without checks and balances because we don't have a parliament anymore. And um, the, the justice system is, is confronting a number of, of serious issues. And, and as a result, you repeatedly have these kind of flare demonstrations, like uh, the, one of uh, the leading figures in the justice system was murdered a couple of months ago. As a result, there were a number of demonstrations, including uh, students in, the, in law school. And uh, one of the students was killed 
during repression by the police of these demonstrations, which led to even more demonstrations. So you've got these, these incidents that people being just disgruntled and, and unhappy and the, the smallest little thing uh, leads to a big flare and demonstrations that sometimes and in, in quite a lot of, of violence between clashes with the police and um, sometimes even people um, burning cars, particularly cars that belong to the state. Um, so that, that's a bit of a volatile situation in the middle of that insecurity has really been picking up. Um, kidnappings are on the rise and as have been um, murders and, and assassination. So that has everybody a bit on, on, on edge too. And um, to make things even more complicated, the, the, there had been a, a rise, or rather the, the value of the gold had been dropping since March, April, May, like that, from around 95 to 110, 120 in August. That phenomenon, it looks like it was linked quite a bit to speculation, not so much because of the economy. And so the central bank intervened, wanting to stop the speculation and regulate that exchange market much more. And I think this kind of snowballed a bit out of control. And so the exchange rate, um, changed from 120 goods for a dollar at the end of August to actually it's 62 something goods for a dollar. Now, some people actually are happy with this because the, one of the effects is that the, the price of imported goods, especially food, like rice and milk, for example, is really going down. Now, at the same time, even the importers, they're, they're not so clear about how this thing is going to evolve. So they don't necessarily lower the price fully, you see, but they lower the price and so people are happy. The, the, the prices of gasoline have come down. They haven't come down completely as much as they should have come down if it was just the exchange rate being, but they have come down, so people are happy. At the same time, this is really a disaster for the economy because local production has suddenly become totally uncompetitive, competing against the, the Dominican products or against imported products is even more complicated than what it already was. And exported products have become way more expensive, making Haitian products less competitive on the market abroad. So it's very bad for the economy and it's very difficult for Fon Jose because our budgets are in dollars, but a, quite a big part of our expenses are in gold. And so as the prices haven't come down as much as the value of the, of, the, of the dollar, our activities have suddenly become quite more expensive where you used to pay, you know, if I pay a hundred, let me take an easy number, 120 gold to train one person, to have one meal for a person during a, a training, I used to only need $1 to buy that meal. Now I need to. So all, our, our, all our, our expenses are quite more expensive. The other people who are suffering really a lot is our staff because our staff is being paid in dollars. We pay our staff in dollars because our, our income is in dollars and because it, it gave them a bit of a, of a protection against the inflation that was going on before but of course, right now, they've lost quite a bit of their purchasing power because of this 
Um, so we're, we're looking at what is, what is going to happen. It's almost sure that the good will go up again, but we don't know how much nor how quickly. And it's almost sure also that prices will continue to drop, but again, we don't know how much and, and, and uh, how quickly. So this only adds a level of uncertainty in a country where there's already a lot of uncertainty going on. I don't know if Steve or Stanley wants to, to add something about the current situation. Yeah, I, I would just add, I think it's really important to recognize, especially the CLM's field staff, that during months and months, both of threats from COVID and from an unstable political situation that could involve roadblocks and rocks, our team, the men and women who go out into the field every day, never stopped. If that meant stepping over a burning barrier in a street by talking in a friendly way with the, the folks staffing that barrier, that's what they would do. Uh, if it meant um, wearing masks and carrying around alcohol and keeping distant, that's what they did. So our staff, um, I was, I've been so proud of them for the last, you know, last couple of years, especially at the way they just haven't let any of that stuff be more than a nuisance. Mm -hmm. So that's what it is for CLM, it's a nuisance. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Corinne. Stanley, I actually want to ask the final question to you. And it's one of the questions, someone put it in the question box. But can you tell me what story or what client you are most proud of? Um, when we talked before, you told me a story that was very inspirational. And I wanted to know if you could share that um, with us again. The, the, the client that's changed the most um, as you've been uh, uh, working at CLM, the member that's changed the most. Um, well, as I, I told you um, last week, um, I, am, I am an accountant, so I have a, a degree in accounting. So in Haiti, when um, you are um, an account um, an accountant, so when you see, when you when you say accounting, you see um, go to um, a office every morning and wear a tire and. Um, a right, um, a, a right, um, <laughs> like you, <yeah>, yes, <laughs> but not go to climb the mountain. So my family um, saw me like that. So sometimes who, who, some someone who will work in a bank or something like that, but. Um, that was not the plan of, of, of God. Because you know the kind of work I'm doing now in CLM, um, I'm very, very proud about it because this kind of, of work, there is no price. Yeah, this kind of, of work, there, there is no price. Um, some of my friends always call, called me accounting of over outside something like like, like that because that, that work I'm working um, as a case manager I have to um, I have to um, every early in the morning every day I mean um, from from Monday to Friday um, go to go to um, claim, claim the river, drive my motorcycle, and have, um, have to, I have to um, do face um, with um, on inspector challenge, um, things like that. So, but I'm not, um, 
I'm very proud of this kind of work. Um, case manager, that means a lot for me because um, this kind of work changed my life. Um, I see people another way and I can say I see life another way. So I'm very pr pr proud of, the, of our work. And so one day, like I said, um, I hope um, the CLM program um, established all over in, in Haiti because um, the, the Haitian people need that, okay? So they, 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 the, so the Haitian people need that. For what I say, thanks for all the partners all over the world. And um, I say, I can say, may God bless them because they they helped some people, there's people to um, to fight with uh, the life, to have a better life. Thank you, Stanley. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Corinne. Folks, we've come to the end of our conversation this evening. I'm sorry for the questions that we haven't been able to get to. Um, we will answer those questions separately. Um, but tonight, as we say goodbye, I want to give a special thanks to all of the folks who have supported the CLM program through the years with your time, your treasure. Um, it is not um, lost on us, the sacrifices that you make to support our program. But I also want to highlight something really important that Stanley said. And when I asked him about a life transformation, he said his own life had been transformed by the work that he's been doing for Franco Jose. And I think that that's a testament, a huge testament to the work that we are doing. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight, um, for giving us your attention. Um, you know, you're probably overwhelmed by Zoom programs on a regular basis. Um, so thank you for carving out an hour and sitting with us and listening to the important work that Franco Jose and specifically my colleagues in the field are doing day in and day out. Like Stephen said, no matter the situation, no matter the drop in, in the dollar, no matter the what's burning in the street, they are getting out to visit our members and make sure that they're getting on with the work that needs to be done at hand. Um, many of you have asked um, online, what ways can you engage with Franco Jose? I think Corinne outlined a little bit about what the needs are um, in the CLM program particularly. Um, but I'm happy to follow up with any of you privately um, if you have specific questions. Thank you again for coming, and we hope to see you at the next Voices of Hope conversation, which we hope will be in the not-too-distant future. Stay well, be safe, and be healthy. Talk soon.